Um, hello, um, my name is Kieran O'Leary from the Irish Film Institute. Um, I'm a, a volunteer stage coordinator for the morning. Um, so I'll be just kind of bringing people up and giving people two minute warnings and that kind of thing. Um, I would just like to introduce our first speaker, Ethan Gates from NYU, hey, um, who will be speaking on the next generation and incorporating open media and standards into AV archives education. Thanks, Karen. Uh, my name is Ethan Gates. Uh, I work as the technician for New York University's uh, graduate program in moving image archiving and preservation. Um, so I'm responsible for maintaining lab spaces, including video and uh, audio analog digitization workstations, uh, a legacy computing digital forensics lab, uh, and consult with NYU's faculty about implementing archival technology in the classroom. Uh, I've also done some freelance workshop instruction for a group called the Metropolitan Library Council in New York City, um, which is all to say that my experience um, when I discuss incorporating uh, open media formats and standards in the classroom today, that I'm coming from an American, uh, American academia uh, and professional development perspective. So I'd be interested to hear today from people maybe coming from a slightly different angle at all this. Uh, so why bring open standards into the classroom? I think the advantages are fairly obvious on both sides. Um, for the open source community, you get some fresh eyes on the projects that you're working on, feedback on usability of tools, clarity of standards from new, potentially inexperienced users. Um, indoctrination, perhaps, you know, usually a bad word, but I think it's the truth here um, that we're really converting people to a certain methodology and way of doing things. And, you know, we're all advocates for um, open source and the, you know, sort of political philosophical perspective on why we work in open source. Uh, and getting more people through the classroom, through, standard, through um, students, you know, by putting that in front of more people, uh, you get more people to adopt, really. I mean, the more it's pretty obvious like in the classroom, like what you present to students is what they're going to bring um, into their own professional work in the future. So the more people hear about it, the more people are going to convert, the more users and contributors a project is going to gain. And then thereby, you know, the more users you get, the likelier your project is to really survive and thrive into the future. Uh, for, for educators on the audiovisual archiving side, uh, a comprehensive approach. It's more really an imperative than an advantage, I think, for educators to be able to present all of the options available to them as audiovisual archivists. Um, and open source is certainly one. Um, so again, I think you're sort of obligated to at least present it. Uh, applicability. Open source projects, uh, because they are totally transparent, code and um, standards available for everyone, offer a unique opportunity to see how concepts of archival theory and philosophy translate down to hands-on work in the field. Uh, and it's always good to present concrete examples uh, in front of students. Uh, and advocacy, anyone who claims educators are politically neutral uh, are lying, in my opinion. And if we really support open exchange of knowledge and information, as you know, many of the faculty that I work with claim to do, um, you pretty much have to support or, again, at least present open source in front of your students. Uh, and this is not a drill, not really just a matter of classroom exercise, at least, again, in the program I work with, um, because of the current cultural economic climate in the United States, at least around archival, the archival profession, students, interns, just graduated professionals are frequently making decisions uh, or at least having a prominent voice in media reformatting and data management in many, many audiovisual collections. Uh, I don't mind saying myself that barely out of the digital preservation class, I graduated from the program that I work for, by the way, which I failed to mention, um, barely out of the digital preservation class where I pretty much just was where I started to learn what open source meant um, only a couple of years ago. Um, I was involved in making technical specifications for reformatting collections at City College of New York, La Mama Experimental Theater Club, uh, the Jewish Museum. I'm not saying that my word was the last on any of these projects. Uh, 
certainly, but the point is in any of these discussions, I could really only apply what I knew, um, which is certainly not as much as I know now. Uh, so what's the problem? What's missing or can be improved in discussions of open source in academia and educational environments? Uh, the myth of best practices, this idea that many students coming into educational programs or the projects that they're working with at institutions, someone is going to say to them this idea of just tell me what to do with my digital or digitized files. Um, I would note my ob observation here is that um, digital preservation instructors um, and a vast majority of students are savvy enough to realize that context is key um, and that best practice will vary largely by institution, collection, individual. Um, but they are all extremely likely to encounter these questions at their, their internships and jobs from perhaps supervisors who are not as familiar with the nitty gritty work um, that we do. So justifying practical in-house application of an open source standard or media format or tool um, as the best practice for that case uh, requires the ability to assess and navigate the ability and knowledge of fellow staff of institutional finances and resources. And that is something, a discussion that is um, not always fully thought through in educational environments, the ability to how to navigate um, those decisions. Uh, when it comes down to it, teaching practice in the classroom is also more difficult than teaching theory. Um, the practice of archival work, an endless series of troubleshooting, highly specific contextual problems, um, is fundamentally antithetical to many models of instruction, um, wherein experts in the field are asked to teach how to do video preservation, digital preservation, film preservation, um, and then evaluate students on how well they understand these hopelessly broad idea and this idea that in the classroom, uh, fundamentally, you're going to have to go down and give a student a grade um, is a very difficult thing for, for uh, instructors to navigate um, when it comes to you know, these, again, really broad, possibly nebulous um, topics. Um, and the key is to impart strategies, not specifics really, but how do you do that in a classroom environment? Uh, open source tools are not equal to open source methodology. Using an open source tool or standard is not like using a non-open source equivalent. By using it, you enter into a community and your feedback and your contribution into that community becomes paramount. When I see uh, tweets like this, this frustrates me that the uh, you know, an open source community like that around Archivematica could be in the total dark about um, institutions and users uh, using their tool and not offering any feedback about how that tool has been applied in their circumstances, which would be useful to the developers. Um, so that, and what I, th I, where I think this comes from, you know, this trickles down into the educational environment where um, this completely different model of interaction, support, um, and practice that you get in the open source community is missing from many discussions um, in educational environments. Um, it's not, using open source is not just about the sort of like superficial advantages of being able to see, learn, manipulate code, um, the no upfront cost. Uh, it's a completely different model of work uh, that traditional academic environments are unsure how to teach, how to uh, evaluate uh, labor, uh, for instance, of you know non-traditional like tech support lines on um, hiring staff who can uh, maintain open source tools in that institution's environment. Uh, that these are again situations that instructors are often unsure how to teach, uh, and it translates into low confidence of students graduating out of professional programs when they actually go into. Uh, professional environments and are unsure how to evaluate, again, staff costs and needs of implementing open source tools formats in their own work. Um, so what can we do? Uh, just some tips for both sides of the equation here. Uh, in terms of archival educators, um, some tips for more broad theoretical seminar courses. There's, um, we need really some philosophical background, that is why the open source community is the way it is, some history um, that contextualizes the difference between working with um, open source and you know, uh, proprietary tools uh, that they are probably used to in terms of you know, most students coming in having 
you know, used Mac and Windows or proprietary software like Adobe, Avid, they, they know these systems of like you call, you pay for some software and you call a hotline and get some support. They don't necessarily understand the open source models um, or where these communities come from. Uh, valuing labor, again, this is, this is a big, I mean, broader discussion even than open source really in the, I think, archival community of how to evaluate our time. Uh, like I said, but just beyond teaching open source, students have very little idea how to literally put numbers to knowledge, time, um, support of their peers um, or themselves. And that is something that our community, the educational community needs to work on. Uh, for more lab-based, uh, hands-on oriented courses, uh, reaching out for ideas, uh, directly approaching open source projects um, leads for ideas in incorporating their projects into the classroom. Um, or, you know, broader discussions with open source uh, developers of, you know, what, what educational degree did you receive? Or was there specific knowledge uh, or strategies learned in your educational environment as a software developer or engineer that, uh, in computer science that could be applied or brought into archival programs? Um, Assignments, class projects, um, perhaps with a willing project, you know, once you've approached and made contact, base actual assignments around building documentation or contributing issues, tickets, bug reports to open source projects. Um, that is a, you know, at least to some degree trackable uh, qualitative or quantitative assessment that you can do. I mean, how many issues a student contributed to an open source project is, is not necessarily a good grasp of, of how well they understand the concepts, but it's something to, to start building an evaluation on. Uh, and eventually bottom line it, I mean directly showing tangible differences between open and non-open source formats and standards and framing it not just as, you know, this is FFV1 and this is QuickTime, but this is open source and this is non-open source so that they understand that framework. Uh, on the other side, what can open source developers and project managers do? Uh, making your project a space where new and unexperienced users can feel comfortable um, contributing, uh, whether that's providing direct guidance, instructions, documentations uh, on your project that show students or new users where they can, um, where they can contribute to your project. Um, sorry, lost in my notes. Um, and also a, a willingness to, you know, for new users to come into your project, realizing that you're potentially going to get some unhelpful contributions from inexperienced users, um, but be willing to provide constructive criticism um, and accept that not all that feedback is going to be useful to you. Um, <coughs> sorry. Uh, and codes of conduct are a great way to um, make sure that your uh, space, your project is going to be inviting um, to all possible users. And I should say that actually that should be an obligation of the educators on the other side as well to seek out projects where their students are going, you know, whatever institutional policies or, or you know, personal <laughs> ethics guide their instruction, um, they should be making sure that that translates into the open source project or community that they're stepping into as well. Uh, but finally, project managers, developers, um, doing your own part in creating assignments or bringing open source projects directly into the classroom may involve, uh, if you're interested in like, you know, having students uh, learn these open source tools, learn your project and making sure it continues on into the future that way, um, you know, inquire directly with relevant programs, classes, or uh, instructors, um, whether there is a way that your project can be relevant um, to what they're doing. Um, they might not accept you, but, you know, you tried. Uh, that's, that's all. Thank you. This is my contact information, and I look forward to talking with you more this week. So just if there's any questions for Ethan, we have a few minutes. Um, and just, um, we have a remote mic for anyone that it will be kind of accessible for us to give it to. Otherwise, uh, we just repeat the question for the live stream. So any questions? 
uh, Carol Lugan Hoyos at the back from FFmpeg. Um, you said before that you believe it's important for open source projects that they know about their users, and I believe you meant that they even love to hear from their users. Yes, of course. Now, I don't want to contradict, but I'd like to point out that there may be some open source developers who do not agree. <laughs> Who don't agree with what exactly? Well, I'm sorry. Who believe that they don't? Who don't care about their users? I mean, such developers do exist. Mm. <laughs> well, perhaps that wouldn't be the appropriate project to bring students into in that case. But well, that's kind of you to say. Fact yeah. is that our project is used by m many people and also has a lot of new contributors every year. I'm I'm not mm -hmm. contradicting you. No, no. Neither to your first nor to your second theory. I, want, I just want to turn out, point out that uh, I wish it were as you described it. Thank you. Fair enough. Any other questions? Hello. Hi. I'm Peter and I'm uh, from Slovak Film Institute, and uh, uh, we are using uh, archiving our images in DBX version two format. Mm -hmm. So, what happens if DBX version two will will be? Uh, outdated or some sometime something i'm sorry i don't understand the question <laughs> the you're using dpx and what happens if dpx goes DPX, out of date dpx version 2 version 2 mm -hmm. which was uh, specified in 2003 mm -hmm. which uh, can be sometime outdated mm -hmm. that is not a question I can answer, <laughs> and I hope other people perhaps here will be able to say what will happen when that happens. Okay. Thank you. Just on that note, Kate Maurice here from the Library of Congress who may have... Oh, Kate's here. We're actually just running out of time, unfortunately, but um, that's something we can come back to, I think, later in the conference. Thank you so much, Ethan. Um,